Hello and welcome to this Blackwell Online podcast. My name is George Miller and my guest today is Atul Gawande, who is a surgeon at the Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston and an associate professor at Harvard Medical School. He's just published the Checklist Manifesto, which draws on his experience as head of the World Health Organization's Safe Surgery Saves Lives program. His mission in the project was to try to improve the outcome from surgical procedures worldwide on a tight budget. With the number of operations exploding worldwide and medicine becoming ever more complex and specialised, did he feel it might prove an impossible task, I wondered? I felt even before I got there the project was impossible. And the general sense that against the complexity of trying to make good medical care work for people, that there are these multiple, pay, you know, 300, 500 page documents saying, this is what great cardiac care looks like. This is what great pneumonia care looks like. This is what great malaria care looks like. We've had these kinds of expert commissions coming together saying, please, please clinicians, this is what you should be doing. And I just knew we could not be another recycled effort like that, that there had to be more and there were possible lessons to be found about how people have dealt with the complexity of what we're trying to pull off, not just in medicine, but across many areas where the struggle is you have people at the front line who have great expertise. We couldn't have in medicine people that are better trained, working harder, and given more technology to get their jobs done. And yet the puzzle is, for many of the steps along the way, like in surgery, we have seven million people a year left disabled or dead by complications of surgery globally. At least half the time we know it's from failure to use knowledge that already existed, steps in care that, we, that could have avoided it. And so understanding how we close gaps, not just of ignorance, but of, for lack of a better word, we'd have to call ineptitude, mm. is uh, something very fundamental and, and not just a matter of technique or management. The, the medical terrain that you describe is one of super specialization and at one point in the book you compare it to car components where you've got these very finely engineered precision components but unless they're all working in harmony then they're, they're as good as useless. Yeah, the, the, the comparison with the car is that what we have reached is a point where we have 6,000 drugs, we have 4,000 medical and surgical procedures we can provide. Each of them are incredibly complex and, and, and you have to pull the right thing together in the right way for people so that they have the best chance of, of maintaining their health. And it is a system in the same way a car is a series of components. And our big mistake in medicine is that we have viewed the components as the most important thing. You want the best drug, the best technology, the best specialist. What if you made a car that way, you might put the brakes of a Ferrari in with the Porsche engine and the chassis of a BMW and the body of a Volvo, and all you would get is a very expensive piece of junk that doesn't go anywhere. And there are times when medicine feels exactly like that. You have to be able to design what we're doing so that groups of people can get their job done. And I see it in the operating room. We've graduated from a world where half a century ago, a surgeon just needed some very simple tools, someone to help them get the, you know, the nurse to make sure that they um, have everything they need, and, uh, and an anesthesiologist to give some, some ether <laughs> or the like. And they'd be, you know, this was, it's called an operating theater for a reason. It was the theater for the surgeon to come in under the lights and perform. It is um, not that way. I come into my operating room, it's half a dozen people involved, and I don't understand what they're doing. And I can never, I will never be able to master what the biotechnical engineer does for maintaining all the technology and equipment, what the anesthesiologist has to do to make the anesthesia go well, what the nurse has to do to make sure equipment and everything is operational and that we're thinking about the patient. And they will not understand my plans for the operation and what's critical along the way. And so it is the transition from seeing ourselves as purely experts with technical expertise to learning how to work like a symphony. And of course, the World Health Organization challenge was not about making it work in harmony, principally in high-tech American and Western European hospitals, 
where you've got a sort of panoply of, of um, expensive equipment. It was principally about developing countries, wasn't it, where the challenges are different? Yes, the span of this was that we were seeing explosions in surgery volumes worldwide. We're doing more than a quarter billion operations a year as the economies of the world have improved. And that explosion has occurred in low-income, middle-income, and rich countries. And it's to the point we've exceeded the rate of childbirth, but with death rates 10 to 100 times higher. So when we embarked on this project, the other thing that they told us is we have no money. <laughs> so how do, we, how do we do this? And that's all the more reason that when we embarked on it, I was very skeptical. But what people gathering together recognized was that this was not a problem of get me this technology or get me that series of training programs. All of that would be beneficial, but we were missing the way to knit it together. And when we looked in worlds like aviation, we saw that in addition to specialization and technology, they had one other tool which we don't use, the pilot's checklist, the discipline of a few checks in place to make a team of people handle complexity better. And I think it reflected a certain point that they reached, which we've not reached in medicine. They reached a point of humility in the face of the complexity of what they are trying to do. And that moment for them occurred in 1935 when Boeing put four engines on a plane. The plane no longer was a single engine plane, which was very easy and, and you'd, you'd never have troubles trying to master the, the plane's engine and complexity. But here was a plane that was more powerful than any built and in a spectacular crash killed their top pilot the plane was deemed too much airplane for one man to fly. But then they found that by putting a series of checks in place, yes, the human brain is imperfect. It will be distracted. It will not remember everything that needs to be done. It will have difficulty coordinating with other people. But combining the human brain with a checklist that aims to make sure basic things aren't forgotten and they are in a position to actually master this thing they're trying to do that they could fly that plane and in the end they they um, were able to not only fly that plane successfully and and um, uh, make it the backbone of of uh, aviation in world war ii but build planes that have become phenomenally more complex and sophisticated mm -hmm.